Heart rate can be extremely confusing. I know there are so many metrics that come up out of your heart rate monitor, your training or tracking device, and we often don't even know what to do with it and where to even begin. My name is Devlin Eden from coachparry.com where we help you get fitter, stronger and faster. And today we're really going to talk about a lot of the, the metrics around your heart rate monitor and how to really focus and we want to try and simplify what heart rate is and how to interpret that data. Stick around, later in this video we are going to talk about two very important metrics that if you follow those metrics and you monitor them regularly, they are a way for us to prevent illness and injury before it actually happens. So when we're working with heart rates or any data set for that matter, but in particular heart rate, because there's so many different ways that you can measure it, we have to ensure that the data that we're getting, that heart rate data that we're getting is accurate. Otherwise, it means nothing. You, it doesn't help your training. If you're getting inaccurate data or unreliable data, it really is meaningless. Okay, and so the best way in order to measure your heart rate is with a chest strap. Okay, and, and whichever brands, obviously there's differences in terms of uh, the quality of those chest traps, but that is the most reliable way in order for you to get a, a good and reliable heart rate measure or data points. Most of the wearable devices today will uh, have a heart rate sort of sensor um, in, in the wrist. Those are fine, they, they work, uh, but in terms of the reliability of that whole data set, there's a little bit of questioning as to how reliable that data is. You would have to, if you are doing it on your wrist, it has to be strapped really, really tight just above this wrist bone over here. But even then, there's still a little bit of variance, especially in high intensity sessions. And we do see a, a, a variance of around five to 15 beats from the wrist-based heart rate, which is massive when you're talking around training specifically to zones within a heart rate aspect. And so ideally, chest strap uh, for running, make sure it's, it's, it's strapped quite tight, make sure it's, if you're female, under your sports bra, if you're male, really, really nice and tight. Um, wetting it a little bit beforehand helps that um, the conductivity of the measurement as well, so you get a far more reliable reading. And just be aware every now and then that when you are running past a, an electrical substation or something, you know, there, there can be variances in some of those readings uh, from a GPS and heart rate perspective. Thanks Shona. Now that you know that you're getting accurate data, how do you actually use that in your training and to inform your, your training? One of the first steps to that is actually calculating heart rate zones. Now you've probably heard people saying that a lot and you've seen the zones that your, your unit is, is giving you but again probably doesn't mean anything to you. So I'm going to talk you through very simply what each heart rate zone means in super simple practical terms and how to use that. So we've got zone one which should be the easiest level that you are going to exercise at. It is often associated with recovery um, and active recovery at that. So it's not rest, you're doing some activity but it's very easy, very light. Now in zone one you should almost be able to keep going indefinitely. You should hardly build up a, a sweat unless you're going for a good couple of hours but generally speaking we would aim to use zone one heart rate for recovery sessions and recovery sessions shouldn't be more than 45 minutes in length. So I would put this in the bracket of somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes of super low intensity exercise, basically just above walking. We then get what a lot of coaches talk about, zone two, the aerobic zone. This is the zone we should be spending most of our training in and it is for developing the pathways that we are going to use to provide energy and that's as complicated as I'm going to make this this level but what does it really mean and what should it feel like this is the the zone zone two that we refer to as talking pace okay you can have a robust conversation you've got a light sweat going on when you start getting to an hour 15 an hour and a half you'll you'll start to feel a, a, a little bit tired obviously that particular metric depends on how long you've been you've been running for but essentially for your current level of fitness 
if you do a zone two workout where you can have a fat conversation with whoever you're running with if you're running by, by yourself you should be able to belt out your favorite song of the moment um, and still be able to carry on running at that intensity so that when you get to the end of that work workout you feel like you've done a bit of exercise but really you feel like you could keep going for quite a lot longer then we start moving into your higher intensity structured workout interval type of sessions we work we, we move towards zone three now depending on who you talk to and this again is why heart rate heart or using heart rate is complicated is that people start to split up their definitions around zone three four and five a little bit for but for a real practical use of this as a system your zone three should be around about the intensity that you can hold if you run as hard as you can for say 30 maybe 40 minutes that gives you a very good idea of what zone three is zone three is and people use terminology like threshold essentially you are breathing quite hard you can probably get out a few sentences if you need to communicate with somebody but it's it's really tough and as you get to the end of that 30 40 minutes it becomes really difficult to to train and you'll use zone three for your longer intervals okay so you'll um, try and get into heart rate zone for your longer intervals i would say three minutes plus would be a good example of that with slightly longer um, recovery periods in between those then we move to the zone four and zone five and it starts to get quite difficult especially if you are an inexperienced athlete to dial in on those um, and get the right intensities but i think as a practical guide your zone four are going to be intervals that are definitely shorter than three minutes but probably longer than uh, one minute and then zone five also turn vo2 max we'll just think about those in practical terms as maximum effort so those are going to be very short intervals uh, less than less than a minute with at least equal rest in between because you are going to need more recovery from exerting yourself like that so i hope that gives you a really good broad idea of exactly when and how to use each zone that your watch is giving you so Lindsay has spoken about the, the training zones and how you, how you should feel in those zones. Essentially, we want to be working off a, a, an 80-20 kind of principle, a very polarized way of training specifically. And, and using heart rate is a great metric or tool uh, to be able to measure to make sure you are training in these correct zones, as Lindsay has mentioned. And so the 80% is really nice and easy and slow uh, sort of training. And then the 20% is where you're pushing at a, at a much higher intensity, almost around a, a zone four, as, as Lindsay would have explained. But that's essentially the breakdown of how much we want to be doing uh, in our training sessions. Um, and, and so, yeah, an 80% of that is nice and easy, uh, low intensity from a heart rate perspective, and the 20% um, a little bit higher intensity as we get older or if you are new to running we might vary that a little bit and maybe go a little bit more to 85 percent easier intensity and and, and 15 percent uh, higher intensity but that's uh, very individual based as well all right so shona's spoken about the breakdown of intensities in terms of how much training you should do in various training zones what happens if we train too hard all the time now, the key thing here is we've often spoken, again, we really drive the point home about recovery. If we are training too hard in that 20% or 15% of really high heart rates, high intensities, we're putting our body at a lot more risk of getting injured and ill, as we spoke about. Now, it is key, if you drop those intensities a little bit, we prolong or we delay that fatigue we make sure that you're recovering a lot quicker than instead if you were training at higher intensities all the time. If you train in those high intensities, the next day, it means it takes a lot longer to recover from that session. So you'll also see your heart rate. You might struggle to get your heart rate into required training zones if you have got a quality or a, a higher intensity training session. 
Um, and if you're not regulating and training low enough and keeping that intensity low enough, you're just compromising the quality of the next training session. So it's absolutely important that you don't want to be driving. Not everything is hard. We often speak about how the adaptation of or physiological uh, stimulus or training stimulus, that adaptation happens more in the recovery. So you're not gonna get any faster or stronger by training harder and harder every time. All you're gonna do there is risk the breakdown of potentially getting sick and potentially causing an injury. Thanks, Dev. So the first metric is resting heart rate, and that's pretty easy to measure with or without a heart rate device. You can measure it very easily by feeling for your pulse on the outside of your, your outturned wrist and you count that for a minute using your watch and that'll give you a resting heart rate. Obviously, if you have a um, heart rate device that's measuring accurately, it will give you a number. You want to take resting heart rate within the first 10 to 15 minutes of waking up after you have emptied your, your bladder. And how do you use that information? Resting heart rate does have a pretty strong genetic link. So don't worry too much about what the exact number is. Your number might be 62, your training buddy's number might be 42, and everyone goes, oh, well, you must be so fit. That number is unique to each individual. It's what you do with it that is important, okay? We want it to be fairly stable. It might come down a little bit as you get fitter, and that's fine. We don't worry too much if it's trending in a downwards direction. When that heart rate starts to trend upwards, that's when we want to take note. If it is trending upwards around four or five beats per minute for two days in a row, that will tell you that you need to modify your training. You need to do something about what's happening because you are overreaching, overtraining, you've done too much, you need more recovery time, all of the above. Typically, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to take more rest days, but it always means that we're not going to do any long runs and we're not going to do any hard runs. So you can keep the runs short and easy or supplement with cross training. But we're going to remove hard running and long running from the plan until that heart rate comes down. If you wake up in the morning and you take your heart rate and it's gone up by about 8 to 10 beats per minute, then we need to intervene with 2 to 3 days of rest. You just keep monitoring it every day and as it comes back down, you can then get back to exercise. Very often, that is a sign that you're either getting sick you're already sick or you've horribly overreached. So we immediately have to react to that and change that. The second thing in your more high-end devices that you can track is something called heart rate variability. Now, very, very simple explanation of what that is, is that we have two parts to our nervous system. We've got an excitatory part and we've got a part that helps us to calm down and relax. What we want is a very high interaction between those two. If we have a high interaction between those two, we have high heart rate variability. If we have a low interaction between those two, we've got low heart rate variability. Low interaction means that there is a dominance of one of those over the other, and that only happens when there's a problem. Think fight or flight, okay? When you get into a, 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 an emergency situation, you get the fight or flight, that is a huge dominance of the excitatory nervous system. And that will take a while before we can calm down and get back to, to normal. So if one has a high dominance, that's a problem. And so simply put, how to use it is that the physical heart rate variability that's measured, we want high numbers. When we're starting to get low numbers or that number is starting to come down, exactly the same as with 
resting heart rate, we need to react. So if there are only if it's a small drop in heart rate variability, we might want to watch that for two, three days. If it's not coming right, modify our training. If there's a big drop, we need to cut it out and take a rest. Some of those wearables, and so you need to read your manual, some of the variables give you a heart rate variability score. Okay, and depending on what unit it is, some of them still work on a, a high score as good, some of them work as a high score as bad. So you need to read the manual, make sure which it is, so that you can use it effectively to modify your training when you need to. If you want to know more about um, heart rate and how it works, watch the video on screen. If you like this video, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe.